Welcome to Jason Live. I'm Haley Nelson, and we are back with our STEM career series where we learn about careers in science, technology, engineering, and math from role models in those fields. And today's role model is super duper cool, Dr. Janet Bowman. And Janet is senior principal scientist for, this pharma for the pharmaceutical company Pfizer. She works with scientists at Pfizer and their academic partners to create new medicines. How amazing. We're going to learn all about our STEM role model and more when we connect with Janet in just a moment. But first, I want to remind you that today's event is live and interactive. So if you're joining us from the Jason Learning website, there is a box right below this video window where you can send us in your questions and follow-ups as we go. If You can also send us a tweet to hashtag Jason Live. So we are going to make sure we get as many of you involved as possible. Listen for your name and your question. Right now, it's time to say hello to Janet. Hi there, thank you for joining us. Hey there, happy to be here. Can't wait to see what the questions are. <laughs> we'll have some right from the get-go here. From Gabby from Mrs. Duguay's class wants to know, whoa, she has a pretty specific question. <laughs> describe, describe your job in one sentence. <sighs> My job in one sentence, that's really hard to do in one sentence. Um, coordination of science between academics and biz and uh, industry so my role right now really is to kind of coordinate the activities of a whole bunch of people the people who are in the lab doing the experiments um, my academic partners who are doing the basic science in the lab that we're then trying to translate into a medicine so my job right now is actually really to be a coordinator. Um, well, you, you instead of being at the bench. If, if we could back up just a tiny bit, could you give everybody yeah. an idea of just in general, tell us what a biochemist does. So a biochemist can do a lot of different things. Um, it's a very broad term. Uh, you can do things like protein biochemistry, where you study what makes up the protein, how it interacts. You could produce it in a Petri dish and then purify it. Or you could be someone like myself who does more cellular biology experiments. So I will take cells, or I used to when I was in the lab, uh, I would take cells and put them in a Petri dish and stimulate them to see what they would do in response to those stimuli. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different things that biochemists can do, and it all depends on what you find most interesting where you would probably end up going. That's so neat. It seems like there's so many different directions to take. Evan from Hopewell wants to know what kinds of tools do you use? Uh, we use all kinds of tools. So in terms of doing experiments, we use animals, we use cells, we do what's called tissue culture, so culturing cells in a petri dish. Um, and then we use all kinds of different machines as well to aid in our experiments. Uh, I use something that's called a flow cytometer, which is a machine that can detect fluorescent molecules that you put onto the cells. So it can help you identify what proteins are expressed by your cells. Um, we have robots in the lab that do pipetting for us so that it's accurate. We have all kinds of different machines too many to list and I could throw out names and you all would just be like that means nothing to me so but we use all kinds of different tools <laughs> well Miriam wants to know what are the some of the medicines that you've made so I've been working in industry for six years now and so far the projects I've worked on aren't actually marketed medicines right now I have worked on four projects which are currently beginning their clinical trials. So those are, the projects have all been antibodies, which I don't know if you guys know what those are, but they're proteins that can bind a specific uh, molecule. Mm -hmm. um, and those are currently for a rare autoimmune disease called dermatomyositis. Uh, one is for cancer. Uh, one is for another autoimmune disease that some of you may have heard called lupus. And then the fourth one is actually for a rare form of kidney disease. So all of those are right now beginning their, their trials. And it's 
if they continue to be safe and successful, it's anywhere from another five to eight years before they potentially become an actual medicine that a patient can buy. Well, that's great. The next, the next question we have is really related to that. Uh, <laughs> Nola wants to know, how long does it typically take to make a medicine? Uh, and she's from Ms. Duguay's class. Okay, so taking medicine can take a very long time. The underlying biology, just to identify what pathway or molecule that you want to target, that you want to make your medicine for, can take anywhere from five to ten years. Wow. And then just getting the molecule itself that you would then put into the clinical trials can take anywhere from five to seven years, depending on if you have to, if you hit roadblocks and have to go back and remake something, or if you find out it's not safe and you have to go back and start again. Um, and then once you get your candidate molecule, that's when the, fa the clinical trials start. And there are three phases that it has to go through. First, you have to determine that it's safe. And then you have to do trials that prove you actually are able to impact, positively impact the disease for the patients. Um, and there's a those phase two. sound really good. Yeah, those, <laughs> that's a phase two and a phase three. And those take anywhere from as few as maybe, if you're lucky, about eight years up to can be upwards of 10 to 15 years. Um, because when you get into those patient trials, and especially if it's rare diseases, you have to recruit people who have those diseases who are willing to participate. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of different drug companies out there that are making drugs. So there's competition and being able to get the patients that you need to form the trial to get the results can be challenging. Yeah, I bet. So. Amaya wants to know, when you make a medicine, do you test the medicine on real people or animals? And when you uh, test it, does it always work or no? And if it doesn't, do you try to make different, a different recipe for the medicine at that point? So we test it on both animals and humans. Um, it has to be tested and proven safe in animals before we can even put it into people. Um, so, but it does get tested on people. Um, and those are both healthy volunteers um, who will volunteer to take the medicine to make sure it's safe and patients who have the disease that are trying to be treated. Um, no, they don't always work. Um, and yes, sometimes we will go back and try again. Um, often a program will have not just one molecule, but a backup molecule in case there are problems, in case you know there's an issue with safety. And if the company really believes in the pathway they're targeting and that they can impact, make a positive impact for patients, they may go back and try that other molecule to see if that one will help. So, but they don't always succeed. And I would say probably 90% of the things that we in the pharmaceutical world create fail. So wow. there's a lot, a lot that doesn't make it patients. Well, it must be pretty gratifying to be working on something that potentially could heal so many different people and have a positive impact on the way people live. Yeah, it's, it is what really drives me and many of my coworkers to, to go through the door every day, the thought that what we could be working on could really positively change someone's life and make their life better. You know, that's, it's the end goal, it's the end dream. Aim and to even help one person would just be so phenomenal and give me such a sense of fulfillment because that's really what I do, why I do what I do. It must um, be pretty powerful to counteract the 90% the failure rate. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's uh, sometimes the, the failures can be really tough, but you just, well, you know, you just, something you do could make that difference and for one person and that could change that person's life. And that's a pretty powerful motivation. <laughs> Absolutely. Sammy wants to know uh, if you test on animals, uh, do you if, you, if you use to test the medicine on animals, do you get complaints from people? Wondering, that's from Coast uh, Elementary School in Virginia. 
I um, gave you the question about animal testing. Sorry. Yeah. So I, as a scientist, don't necessarily directly get the complaints. Um, but for sure, there are people who don't approve of it um, and don't agree with it. Um, but the other thing is to put something into a person that has never been tested that could be detrimental is a really high risk. Mm -hmm. um, as scientists, we are working on trying to develop ways to test the safety of things um, in vitro. So there are people out there in the world that are trying to generate 3D organs that you can have in a Petri dish, like a kidney. So you could put a small molecule into that organ in a dish and see if it's toxic as a way to decrease the amount of animal testing that would need to be done. But there are some systems in the body, like the immune system, which is incredibly complicated, has many different parts, which will be incredibly difficult to uh, recreate in a Petri dish. Yes, um, I can't imagine. So, so there are some things where I think we'll be able to, as scientists, gen be able to test things in vitro and reduce the amount of animal testing, but I'm not sure we'll ever be able to fully get away from doing animal testing because it's really important. humans are too complicated to, mm -hmm. to be broken down into a dish. Well, we have Barry McCockner wants to know, um, when are you doing your, um, when are you doing your, well, hold on, when you are doing your labs, wow, I'm having trouble reading today. <laughs> <laughs> when you are doing your labs, do you have any assistants helping? Or, and if so, can you tell us who they are and, and what they do to help? So um, depending on your stage of career, your career, you may or may not have assistants. So if you're, say, a graduate student working in a lab, learning how to be a scientist and all of that, you generally don't have help. You generally do it all on your own. But as you get further and further in your career, you tend to get more and more help. Um, a lot of times the help are technicians. So these are people who have a degree in science, like a bachelor's degree or a master's degree. Um, and they will help and help you do the experiments. Um, sometimes you, if you have a PhD, will be the person who will direct the science. So you'll design the experiment and you'll ask somebody else to carry it out for you. So it really all depends on kind of sort of what stage of your career you're at, whether or not you have help and what that help is. <laughs> I've spent most of my career without help doing it all on my own. It's only been recently where I've had people who I can say, can you do this for me? So I miss the doing it myself, but it's kind of nice to have the help too. <laughs> Yeah, it seems like there'd be nice. I mean, you had mentioned that you loved being at the bench and, and loved doing the work there. That must be like a fun type of solitary work. It, it really is. And for about the last year, I've spent more time at the computer, like I said, coordinating other people's activities. But just last week, I was talking with a postdoctoral fellow that we work with and we were talking about his experiments and, his, and people had asked a question. And at the end, I was like, hey, Ryan. I'll do that experiment for you because I know you don't have time. You don't know how to do it yet. So this past Monday, I actually got back in the back in the lab, pipetted things, did an experiment. It was so awesome. <laughs> Discovered I haven't lost my ability to pipette. Doing another experiment tomorrow. Very excited. Yes. So. <laughs> We have Ain Hopewell Caress wonders. So how is the process? Is it fun and easy or hard but still fun? And uh, Jake has a similar question. He wants to know, how hard is your job and does it ever get confusing? Oh, for sure it gets confusing. Absolutely gets confusing because sometimes you do an experiment and you get a result that you don't expect and you don't know how to explain. So confusion certainly can come into it. And that's when you get those types of things. You talk with your coworkers and other people and say, I don't know what's going on. And you really talk with a lot of people to try and help figure it out and say, how, what could be going on? What didn't I think of? What could this possibly mean? Um, is it hard or easy? That probably all depends on the day. I think like any job, you have your days when things work really well and it's easy and it's fun. 
and then you have days where it seems like nothing you do goes right and everything is hard and you say, why am I doing this? And then you hope that it just lasts for a day and the next day everything gets better. So um, I don't think that's something that's unique to science. Uh, I do think probably most people encounter that in their jobs. But overall for me, I would say it's more fun um, than not. Well, good. That's what we like to hear <laughs> for the, the job you've chosen for your, the rest of your life here. Um, we're going to stay in the lab here because we have three questions all about the lab. We've got uh, Kara, uh, Jonita, and, and, uh, and one more question from Coates Elementary School. They want to know what the lab is like, your favorite thing to do in the lab, and the scariest thing that can happen in the lab. Let's see, I'll go with the last one first. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, scariest thing in the lab is probably, this is going to sound maybe not so great, if a fire breaks out, which I've had actually happen, I think, twice um, in my scientific career. Um, so it happened because we were doing work with animals and people needed to sterilize their instruments. So you dip them in alcohol solution and then you put them in a Bunsen burner to burn it off. And one of my coworkers put it back in the oil before the flame had actually extinguished, so it set the beaker of 70% ethanol on fire. She didn't know what to do. Um, I took a beaker, just put it over the top of it, smothered it, and just like, oh, and I'm like, been through this once before. Because the first time it happened, I was like, I'm out, see ya. <laughs> so that's probably one of the scariest things um, that can happen in the lab. Uh, let's see. The other question was, what do I like to do the most, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think probably almost any kind of experiment I like to do, because I just, I love being at the bench. I love seeing whether or not the experiment works, because there is no greater joy and thrill than designing an experiment and testing a hypothesis and finding out that you're right, because then it feels just so great, because you're like, I was right. Um, <laughs> So I think that's probably my favorite thing is just doing the experiment and getting the result. Um, in terms of an actual technique, that flow cytometry experiments that I mentioned before, those are some of my favorite things because you get the answer right away. You know right away whether or not it worked and you're right or wrong. So that's probably my favorite thing to do. Um, and what was the third question? It was really just a kind of, can you give us a little description of what it's like in the lab? Okay, so what it's like in the lab. That really kind of all depends on the lab you're in because every lab kind of has its own different personality because of the people who work in there. You know, there are some people who are outgoing and, you know, boisterous and talk a lot and like to have music playing when they're doing their work. And then there are some people who like to be really quiet and are more focused and don't like that noise and distraction. Um, like uh, the grad school lab that I was in, we had two different rooms with two different stereos playing and our boss was always yelling things out the office and it was kind of like a zoo. And it was a fun, huge party every day. Um, but I've worked in other labs where there's, it's all quiet and everyone's all focused. So it can really, it can really depend on the place you're in you know, and there are benches and there are equipment and everybody's got pipettes and stuff. So what you would probably picture as a lab is what the physical place would look like. Lab, um, coats and lab coat, coats and safety glasses, generally you're wearing gloves. Um, you know, some people have messy benches where there's just stuff all over the place and other people are very clean in their work environment. So, you know, the whole spectrum. <laughs> well, we have, uh, let's see, we have uh, Harl, Kara, and Alicia. They want to know about the chemicals you use. This, what is your favorite chemical? What chemicals do you use the most? Um, and and uh, this is my favorite. How do you know which chemical is which? So fortunately, the chemicals are all labeled. So that's how you know which one's which. Um, when you encounter something that is unlabeled, that's when you generally call your environmental health and safety department to say, I've got a chemical, but I don't know what it is, and I don't know how to dispose of it, and you ask them to take care of it for you. 
Good because idea. there are some chemicals that are dangerous that like you can't dump down the sink because it would it's toxic to um, the environment. So all the chemicals we use are very tightly regulated in terms of what we can use, how we dispose of them, things like that. So in terms of, I don't know that I have a favorite chemical um, that I work with. Um, so I don't think I really actually have an answer to that one. Is there one you use the most? That was the other question. The one, there's not one particular chemical that I use the most. Um, I use kind of a bunch of chemicals that make up solutions that I use. So when I do tissue culture, I use media that has growth factors that make the cells happy and allow them to live. Um, so that's probably the most common thing that I use in, in my work. Well, we have um, Ali Langloy wants to know, how do you figure out what materials you need for a particular medicine? So that is a combination of things. So um, if you're talking about small molecules, so like the pills that you take, um, medicinal chemists are the ones who figure that out. So they will be given a target, say an enzyme, that has an active site that you want to block its activity. They will look at that and they will do their chemistry wizardry and it's really, it's amazing stuff that they can do and I don't understand it. Um, but they will do these screens that they will put these molecules together and they will create from nothing the molecule that they need. Um, the projects I work on we create medicines that are um, antibody-based. So we have a couple of different technologies in order to identify those antibodies. Um, so the antibodies are a protein. Um, so proteins are what I use most. So um, when you're saying that yours are antibody-based, is that is that kind of more like a vaccine? Kind of so, something that would act more like that? So vaccine antibodies are actually what the body naturally produces in response to vaccines. Mm -hmm. um, so antibodies are a, pro uh, are a protein that everybody makes in response to an infection. Um, if people have allergies, antibodies are what are actually part of that, um, that allergic response. So mm -hmm. you've produced an antibody that binds to your allergen like cat dander for people who are allergic to cats. Um, and the antibodies are bound to a particular type of cell that when, when that interaction, that antibody binds to that cat allergen, it triggers the cell to release histamines and all these things that give you a runny, stuffy nose and sore throat and itchy eyes and itchy skin. So, <laughs> so the antibody is something that the body naturally produces. Um, and we are just using that to disrupt interactions. So you use human antibodies uh, yes. to disrupt. Yeah. Where do you get them? How do you do it? So we get them in a couple of ways. There, we have this thing called um, phage libraries, where basically we have libraries that will express parts of the protein that you can screen to try and identify something that binds the molecule you want. Another way we can get them, and those generate fully human antibodies. Um, there are mice out there that express human antibody genes. So you cool. can actually <laughs> immunize mice and get a fully human antibody that way. Um, the other way we can do it is that we can immunize animals, whether they be uh, rabbits, rats, or mice, and generate uh, an antibody from them, which we then convert into a mostly human, uh, human antibody. So those are what would be called chimeric antibodies that are both animal and human. So. I love it when my mind gets blown. <laughs> like, okay. The, getting, getting down to the nitty gritty here. That's, that's incredibly interesting. Just, I mean, and that's just the start of what you do. So, yeah. um, let's see. Uh, uh, we have, oh, Alexander wants to know, what do you mean when you say bench? Bench. So what I mean by a bench is really it's, it's a table. 
Uh, you know, we have drawers that we keep our supplies, shelves where you have your reagents um, up above you. So it's really, it's kind of sort of like a desk, a big desk where you can do your experiments. Well, we have um, Hamasa from Mrs. Uh, Doraswamy's class wants to know, uh, how do you know the medicine you use on animals will work the same on humans? And, the, and, the, and that's a question coming from Virginia. That is a great question. And it is a question that we as scientists actually ask ourselves all the time. Um, and we don't necessarily know that it is going to work the same in humans as it does in animals. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we need to actually test it in humans. Um, because while we have some similarities with um, primates and monkeys and rabbits and dogs and rats and mice and all these different animals that they can be tested in, we aren't the same. And there have certainly been more than one instance where something works well in an animal and when you put it into a person, it doesn't work the same. Um, I work in doing lupus research and there are multiple mouse models of lupus disease. And lupus is in a human disease is really, really complicated. And all of us who work in the field, we always say we have cured hundreds of thousands of mice of lupus. And there's only been one new lupus drug in the last 50 years and it doesn't cure the disease. So um, it's, it's a great question and it's something that we always struggle with in saying how, does, how do these results translate to people? Because they often don't. Wow. Well, Barry McCockner and Ola want to know, do you ever travel for any big projects? And if so, um, how long are you gone? Or, and where have you gone? So um, you do get to travel. Sometimes you travel to visit your labs where you're collaborating and do experiments with them. And that can be a day, it could be a week, it could be longer. Um, a lot of people will travel to scientific conferences, um, and again, those can be as short as a day or two, up to a week. Um, I have traveled as far as Vienna, Austria um, for conference, and as close as downtown Boston. I've um, been to New Orleans, I've been to San Francisco for conferences. So you can travel all over the world. Um, there was once a conference in Australia that I really wanted to go to, but I couldn't convince my boss it was worth the money. <laughs> so that's so, a big plane ticket. Travel all over the world. All right. Well, I'm waiting until he catches up here again. We, we lost you for a <laughs> second here, but I've got you now. Okay, good. Um, okay. New Richmond Elementary, they have, um, Olivia wants to know, um, which kind of lab environment do you prefer? The one with the fun music or the, the more casual or the quiet, focused, more formal setting? Oh, I totally prefer the loud music, noisy, people talking, having fun <laughs> <laughs> environment than the quiet one. I was, I was going to guess that. That would have been my guess. <laughs> um, we have another question. Um, so could we use an antibody to remove any allergy, like food, like my peanut allergy? So you wouldn't necessarily use it to remove it. Um, allergies are caused by a specific type of antibody. So everybody produces their five different types, something called IgM, IgG, IgE, IgA, and IgD. It's that IgE molecule that is actually what's the problem for people with allergies. Mm -hmm. um, so if you've ever heard of somebody getting allergy shots, basically what those are trying to do is to change the nature of the response that a person has. So instead of producing an IgG, producing one of those other flavors of antibodies because you could still have those antibodies, but if they're of that different flavor, they're not going to trigger those problematic cells. So 
an antibody, you could potentially use an antibody of a different flavor to maybe reduce it to remove those allergens. But really, ideally, what you want to do is just get rid of that IgE response. You want to get rid of those cells or convert them into cells that produce just a different flavor of the antibody. Well, maybe just for the for Kara's sake and her peanut allergy, that'll be the next one, <laughs> the next thing you work on. <laughs> there are, Kara, I can tell you there are a lot of people who are working on trying to figure out how to get rid of allergies and to make allergies better, especially for people with food allergies who have those. Um, there, there are people out there who are trying to work on that and figure out how to to make that better. <laughs> and we're glad that you do. We're glad that's going on. Um, Glenn has a comment. Let's see. Hi, I'm from Coates Elementary School in Virginia. I just uh, want to say thank you. Hey, this is what we were just saying. Um, I want to say uh, thank you. What you do is awesome. And how many tries did it take you to make your first medicine? Let's see. Well, I can say that for the first one, um, we started out and probably screened something around a thousand different antibodies before we got to the first one. And that first one wasn't strong enough for what we needed. So we had to do something that we call affinity maturation, which is basically to try and make that protein better and have a stronger interaction for that. And I think we went through two or three rounds of doing that. And I would say there was a minimum of at least probably 100 molecules that were screened in each one. So I'd say we easily went through 1,500 different molecules before we got to the one that we put forth as, as the medicine. So, wow. And that's, that's just for an antibody project. For those small molecule projects that I talked about, um, they can screen hundreds of thousands of compounds before coming up with the molecule that is the right one. That's incredible. It seems like the limiting factor is time in all yes. of this. Yes. Wow. Because, because you'd say, well, well, you have all this great technology. Why don't you just make the medicine? Well, <laughs> it takes time. It, it takes time and it takes resources. It takes people and it takes money. And we all, those are all limited. So what we have to do is really say, where can we invest our time and our money and our resources to make the biggest impact? Um, and that's a discussion that happens multiple times a year with saying, this is everything we're working on. Do we still think that these projects are the best place for our investment? Or do we think these, is there data that now says, no, this, you want to invest in this because this one's going to be a game changer for people. So um, those are things that happen all the time, is assessing where, what to work on, what's got the best chance of success, and, and those things. Wow, really making a difference. Um, what is the most exciting thing you've discovered in your work, and why? This comes from Hadley. So what's the most exciting thing that, so when I was actually back in graduate school, I was working in a laboratory that discovered a molecule called CD40 that is part of the immune system. And it is an important molecule that basically regulates whether or not your immune, so immune system will re respond. And I was working on a project um, where we thought two, two different types of cells were involved in an interaction. And that was all that you needed for this response to happen. And we discovered that actually a third type of cell was needed that we never would have predicted um, was involved. And so when that realization, I think, probably is one of the most exciting things that I've ever done in my scientific career was to, to discover that it was far more complicated that we, than we thought, that more cells were inter, uh, involved and that this one particular cell had to provide a signal to help those other two cells actually do their job. 
Um, so, and the first time I heard someone else talking about it at a presentation, I was just like, oh, I did that. That's my work. That's kind of cool. <laughs> I can imagine you just must have these like, yes, I did it moments yeah. that they're kind of surreal. Um, a number of years ago, I was actually teaching a class to some uh, college students and I was talking about these interactions that I helped discover. And it was so weird and surreal. And you know, now everybody takes it as fact that this is what happens. But those were things that when I was in graduate school, we didn't know happened. And it was part of those discoveries and it's, it's real. It's weird. It's surreal, but it's awesome. I came up with your sentence, your one sentence. <laughs> you should say, I am on the cutting edge of new discoveries. There you go. I like it. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Amin wants to know, would you be confident enough, enough to test one of your medicines on yourself? Uh, yeah, I think I would. Um, and there are, there actually are countries where um, the scientists who make the medicines are involved in doing that. Someone told me, I, I don't have firsthand knowledge to know that this is true, but that there are European countries where the scientists who make it will be part of the first people who get, who actually get the drug. Um, so yeah, I actually had that discussion once with a colleague about whether or not you would take it because somebody had said that they, I think somebody had said that they might not want to. And uh, another colleague's reply back was, well, if you aren't willing to take it, why should somebody else be able to? And it was really kind of a light bulb moment of like, yeah, you're right. If you don't think that it's safe enough for you to take, would why are you asking somebody else to take it? So, so yeah. Very interesting. Like yeah, there's, there's a lot of ethical kind of sort of questions and concerns about testing drugs on people. Um, and it's really, it's a very complicated issue for sure. Absolutely. I can think of a million ethical questions, but I'm going to let the yep. students ask their questions. Yeah. <laughs> um, Corey and um, Mike Ox um, Oxlong, they have a similar question. Corey wants to know, um, what did you love doing as a kid? And Mike wants to know, as a child, what was your dream job? So as a kid, I would not say that I was necessarily a science geek. I was a normal kid who loved to play sports and go outside and play. Um, so I don't think I was really per se, I mean, like I was like every kid and like, you know, it was fun to like watch ants crawl around and we did the, you know, magnifying glass and sun and burned a few ants in our, in our days. Um, but that's probably the closest I got to being kind of sort of like a science nerd as a kid. Um, I was more of a, of a sports junkie as a kid. Um, but in high school, I had a biology teacher who was teaching us about DNA, and he had made a 3D model of a ladder that could twist to show us what a DNA helix would look like. And then he would keep collapsing it to say, this is what coiled DNA looks like. This is what super coiled DNA looked like. So we, it could help us envision what was going on in the cell. Because these were, back in my day, which I'm now dating myself, um, were pretty reasonably new discoveries. Um, and he had made a puzzle, kind of puzzle pieces that he put up on the board that were the different bases that make up DNA. And he's like, here's one strand. Who wants to put up the complementary strand? And I'm like, I do. Ran up to the board and put up the strand. I'm like, this is awesome. This is so cool. This is what I want to do. And that's literally the moment where I'm like, science is for me. I want to do this. So, um, you know. What a, great, good, what a great thing to know that moment for yourself, you know? Yeah, I mean, I knew I always wanted to stay in school because I liked school. It was fun for me. It kind of sort of came naturally. And I'm like, I'm just going to stay in school as long as I can. But I never knew what it was in school that I kind of wanted to do. But that moment for me was like science. I want to do science because this is awesome. So <laughs> I hope um, I hope that lots of people watching end up having a moment that's that clear about science. 
I think that's that's kind of unique and wonderful. Um, so uh, actually, we have another question. Oh, well, there we go. Barry wanted to know what point in your life did you know what you wanted to do? Um, oh, but that's uh, that's about your job. So we have so that's what did you when did you know what you want to do for a job? And Delaney said, when did you realize you wanted to be a biochemist? Okay, so uh, you already know the story now about when I just discovered or knew that I wanted to go into science. Uh, in terms of being a biochemist, um, that kind of sort of happened by default, because when I went to college and had to decide what my major would be, there was a particular class that the was required for a biology major that I didn't want to take, so that eliminated biology as a major. Uh, there was way too much mathematics for me to be a physics major, so that eliminated that. And chemistry, I wasn't sure if I really loved inorganic chemistry and wanted to take more than a year of it, so that kind of ruled out chemistry. So by default, biochemistry became my major, which ended up being a great thing because I actually really liked it. And when I was a senior in college, I'd forgotten about the fact that you had to apply to graduate school. So I had to change my plan and I had to do work for a couple of years before going to graduate school. Also ended up being best mistake of my life because by getting a job, I work, ended up working in a biochemistry or in a infectious disease lab. So it opened up the entire world of medical research to me that I didn't know existed before then. And when I worked there, one of my coworkers was like, hey, you want to take a night class with me on immunology? Because we worked in an immunology lab, and I didn't really have a bit understanding of like the bigger picture of everything we were doing. I'm like, sure, why not? Took the class, fell in love with it, totally changed my research direction. I was doing, I thought I was interested in protein biochemistry when I was an undergraduate. I think back now and be like, what was I thinking? Because that would bore the bejesus out of me now. <laughs> and so I took the immunology class, fell in love with it, went to graduate school for immunology work. And when I was in graduate school, I always thought I wanted to become a professor. Um, but when I was in graduate school, I found out I loved doing experiments. I loved being at the bench. And to be a professor, you're taken away from the bench. You don't get to do as many experiments. So I did stay in academics for about 12 years. And then I just decided it really wasn't what I wanted to do because I wanted to continue working at the bench. And I wanted the research that I was doing to lead to more than just more knowledge in the scientific world, that I wanted to be part of the group of people who are making medicine. So that's when I changed, turned my career into the pharma world um, and started working for pharma and doing what I do now. So if you asked me what I was gonna do in high school, I would have given you a very different answer than what I would do today. And even though I work in pharma right now, it doesn't necessarily mean that in 10 years I'm still going to be doing it. Because there are so many more aspects to science than just doing bench work or doing the science. There are people who work in law firms who, you know, basically work on the, the law of science and protecting knowledge. Um, there are patient organizations who advocate for, for patients, who fund research, and you know, I could end up working for a patient foundation someday as reviewing a science and being an advocate for people. So um, you, know, you, you can have one idea and you can have one plan, and as you go forward through it, you never know what kind of sort of curves and bends in the road that you're gonna take that may lead you somewhere else that will lead you to something amazing. So while having a plan is good, Sticking to that plan no matter what, roll, roll with the punches, roll with the tide, and, and pursue what is your passion and what makes you happy. Because if, as long as you pursue that, then you're going to love what you do. It really seems like that that's your real plan. You followed yes. what made you curious and what made you excited. Just one moment. Hey, Melissa, do you want to take a night class in immunology? <laughs> What a cool thing to have a friend <laughs> just randomly ask you to do. That's a friend right there. <laughs> yeah, and it's it was, I was just like, sure, I got nothing to lose. Maybe I'll understand what you people talk about. And <laughs> honestly, it was the best thing, like, ever. Because I'm so 30, I think it's probably close to 30 years later, I still think immunology is amazing and fascinating. 
So, you know, I, I was so fortunate that I lucked into taking that class and finding the thing that I just, that is definitely my passion for science. Well, we have a question from Corey about if you looked up to any scientists when you were a kid. Honestly, I don't really think that I, I, I can't ever say that there was a particular scientist that I looked up to as a kid. Um, like I say, when I was a kid, I was, you know, playing softball and basketball, and I don't think that science was necessarily even, you know, really in my head. Like, my mom made my sister do the science fairs. I never did the science fair. Um, and it was really, it really wasn't until I got to high school and had that biology teacher until, like, really my interest in science was sparked. Um, so... We have some, this is very interesting. These are uh, two, I'll, I'll just ask these one at a time. Um, is it possible for, um, for a different effect to happen on two people? I assume that means if they're given the same, um, the same medicine that you're testing. Uh, I can't, I don't think I can really give you a definitive answer of yes or no, but I'd say it is possible because people can have mutations in their genes. Um, so if there is something that hits, you know, a protein and somebody has a mutant form of the protein, it is possible that there would be a different response or they wouldn't respond. Um, I mean, there are certainly lots of people who have diseases who are given medicines where that medicine doesn't help them versus people who it does help. So I guess in a way, that's maybe what he's even, it's an example of what he's, he's asking about, where there are people where the medicines have a positive effect and work, and there are people who it has no effect whatsoever on. So I guess actually the answer would be yes. They, people, different people with the same thing can have a different response. And it would seem like most of the time that that would happen, would you even you know, know why or have a way to find out why, or are you just... Sometimes, sometimes we would have a way to know. Um, so, so like rheumatoid arthritis, there's people, you may see commercials for this drug called Humira. It's mm -hmm. an antibody that blocks a molecule called TNFs. Um, and Humira works for some people and it doesn't work for other people. And one reason that it might not work for somebody is that they don't have this TNF protein present in their disease. So you could screen the person to say, do they have TNF or do they not? If they don't have it, then that's an explanation for why that drug wouldn't work. If they do have it and it doesn't work, then you kind of have to ask, well, do they have an antibody that's preventing the drug from hitting the target, and is that why it doesn't work? So there would be more that would be involved in trying to figure that out. But sometimes you do know, and sometimes you don't. Very, very complex. Yeah. Um, and we have a question uh, from childhood. Were you ever bullied because of your likings? I would say, yeah, there's, there was there were times there wasn't, I was kind of sort of a, the weird little kid in that I didn't fit into any one kind of sort of group. Um, I was the smart kid, but because I played sports, I had friends who were in that kind of sort of group and click. Um, so I kind of sort of lived in a bunch of different worlds, but I definitely had people who, you know, didn't like me because I was smart and I can remember an instance where somebody was trying to cheat off my test in a biology class, and I caught her. So I took my stack of books, and I moved it over to the side where she was, and I leaned over, and I put my head down so she couldn't see my paper. Um, but for me, I was just like, hey, I did the work. I'm, I'm not okay with that. Um, and, you know, I just knew that it was okay because I wasn't going to be there forever. High school was only four years, and I would get out of high school, and I would move on to the next thing, and I was just, I was who I was, um, and people were either going to take that or they were going to leave that, um, and I didn't have to be friends with everybody because I was okay with myself.
It's it, I like that. It's only four years. That's how I yeah. felt about it as well. <laughs> yeah. In and, and bad times, but it was like, all right, this is a limited amount of time. Then I have the rest of my life. Yeah. And, you know, as you move on, you meet new people and you eventually find people who have those similar interests to you. You know, I mean, I have plenty of friends who now were like, you know, we laugh about things. And it's like, oh, yeah, this, that. You know, you you eventually find those people that have similar interests with you, and there will be people who will accept you for all your weird quirks. Um, you know, so you just have to give it time because you'll find those people because they're out there. Yes. Um, we have a question about saying, were you nervous when you first went to your job as a scientist, and which lab did you go to first, the social or the focused? Um, so yes, everyone, I don't know anybody who's not nervous and going to their first day of any new job, no matter what it is, even if you think you're going to crush it, you're still nervous because I want people to like me. Am I going to do well? Do I know what I'm doing? Are people going to figure out that I'm a fraud? We all have these questions. <laughs> we all have the nerves. Everybody says they never felt it. They're lying to you. Um, so the first, in terms of the labs, the very first lab I worked in, in college, it was kind of sort of a mixture of the, uh, quiet and noisy. There were two of us who were a little on the noisy side and one that was very quiet. Um, my first academic, my first job was definitely started out as a quiet lab, became a noisy lab because I became the lab DJ. Um, my graduate school, I rotated through three different labs. Two were kind of sort of more of the quiet. Um, the third one was the party lab. That was the lab I ended up joining. It's my least successful rotation, but it was where I had the most fun. So that was where I went and it was the best decision in the world. Um, my first academic postdoc was definitely a quiet lab when I started. It was a noisy lab when I left. <laughs> So I, I've got I've done there. range of experience. <laughs> um, Brett would like to know, oh wait, let's see, uh, and they're in Turner, Maine. Let's say I want to be a biologist, how would I start? And, oh, and this is a related question from um, Han Reddy's Clue. For fourth graders in Franklin Square, New York, what advice would you give us about choosing a career in science? Is there anything you would do differently if you were going back to fourth grade? to do it all over? So I don't think that I would go back and do anything different um, because the mistakes that I've made led me to where I am and I love where I am. Um, so like I said before, having a plan is great, but making that plan is something that is steadfast and unbreakable. I don't think that's the right thing to do because there's so much out there to discover. Um, as a high school kid, I did not know any of the things that I've gone on to do in my career in the last 30 years even existed to say that's what I want to do. And some so, of them didn't. You know, what I can say or my advice is explore everything. If you love bugs, go to your local science museum and see if they have an exhibit on bugs. Talk to people at a science museum or, you know, go online and see if there's like an entomology club or something where you could talk to people who study them, who could teach you more and maybe, you know, kind of sort of light that fire. Um, you know, talk to your science teachers and say, I really love doing this. You know, see if there's even maybe an extra credit project that you could do with your science teacher where you could learn more. Um, or see if they know something of a resource where you could learn more, you could interact with people who do that. Um, you know, and just continue that search um, for what you want to do. You know, kids who like building things and robotics, see if there's a, you know, a club where you can build robots. You know, I know there's BattleBot competitions that are a big thing. I have a couple of friends who are big into that. And, you know, just look for those kinds of opportunities just and discover. 
And it may be that when you do them, you find they're not as exciting as you thought they were. And that's totally okay. Go look for something else. If science is what you think you love, keep exploring science until you find that one bit of science that you're just like, this is the coolest thing ever. Because you'll find it eventually. Well, keep on that same note, we have time for one more question and, and one comment that somebody sent in. JP yeah. wants to know, what are you looking forward to discovering in the future? I don't, I, I don't really have a particular thing that I'm looking forward to discovering. I'm looking forward to continuing the work that I do that hopefully will change someone's life. You know, that is my end goal, is to make something that is going to make someone's life better. And if I get that, then I have I've fulfilled my purpose um, in, in what I do. So I would say that'd be it for me. <laughs> okay, well, here's, here's a great comment that someone sent in. Um, Adit says, oh, wait, let's see. Oh, Aditi says, you're my best scientist. You're the best scientist ever. Well, biochemist. Oh, thank you. That's so nice. That's <laughs> awesome. And unfortunately, we are all out of time. Janet, thank you so much for taking the time to come and answer all these questions and be with us here today. This is my pleasure. I had a lot of fun, and these are a lot of great questions from the kids. And I hope you guys find whatever it is in life that is your passion, whether it's science or something else. Just find whatever you love because then you'll love what you do. Oh, you rock. Oh, <laughs> I wish we didn't have to end. Um, <laughs> Me too. Right. I'm having so much fun. <laughs> Me too. This is great. We'll just, we'll just talk for hours after this. Anyway. <laughs> well, our next live event is going to be on December 7th and featuring STEM role modeling our STEM role model, Marcos, Marcos Sastre Cordova. And Marcos is an ocean engineer at Raytheon where he uses undersea sensor systems technology to develop products that protect the lives of soldiers who are deployed at sea. Very cool. So send that in those amazing. questions. Yes, right? You can join yeah. us on that one too. That sounds very <laughs> cool. <laughs> well, until then, uh, for Jason Learning, I'm Haley Nelson, and we'll see you next time on Jason Live.